Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about uh, specifically in this first talk is the the, the Gottsman nil theorem. And so I mentioned this uh, I mentioned this in passing yesterday, but we're going to look at it in a lot more detail uh, now. Okay, so what is quantum computing? Okay, so as we saw yesterday, uh, quantum computers use the resources of quantum mechanics in some sense to solve computational problems more efficiently than than would be possible using at least known classical means. And in some cases, this quantum speed up, so-called, can be dramatic. And by dramatic, I normally mean exponential. Okay, so the question arises, uh, like what is the explanation for quantum speed up? And as we as we briefly talked about yesterday, there are some there's there are some different uh, there are some different possibilities that people have put forward. So, for example, there's the many worlds explanation, that's defended by David Deutsch and by Ewood Horstman from two thousand nine. There's a quantum logical interpretation defended by Jeffrey Boob, and there's and there are others as well. Now, the one that I'm going to consider today is I'm not sure if it really makes sense to call it a competing explanation. Because entanglement, I mean, it's, of course, people who defend the many worlds explanation are not ignorant of the fact that entangles, uh, quantum systems can be entangled and it forms a part of, 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 of their explanation. Same, it forms a very central part of Jeff Boob's uh, explanation and so forth. So it's not so much a competing explanation, but it kind of, it's one of the things underlying all of the, all of the, all of the, uh, uh, well, at least, the, the more plausible uh, explanations of quantum computing have entanglement underlying it in, in some way, right? It's something that they all need to account for in any case. Now, uh, some people have argued that entanglement is all that you really need, right? And so uh, what might motivate this is, the, is comparing the state spaces of classical and quantum systems. And, and as we'll see in, 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 a, in a little bit, by looking at things like that, we can we can come to a hypothesis that entanglement can be used as a resource to enable quantum speed up. And in this talk, we're going to be investigating that question in particular. In what sense should we think of entanglement as that's being used as a resource to enable quantum speed up? So, given that we do not don't want to deny don't want to deny that entanglement plays a role in, compu in computation. And certainly, none of these people want to deny that. We can we can ask the question of on the one hand, so what kind, what role does it play? Is it is it necessary for speed up? Uh, is it sufficient for speed up? Is it both? So of course, these are logically different questions, right? So because. Because even if possessing an entangled state is sufficient to enable speed up, it might be that there are alternative ways to enable it. And on the other hand, even if entanglement is necessary to enable speed up, it doesn't follow that nothing else is necessary. Right? And so today I'm going to be focusing on the second question. Now, the Gottsman nil theorem, as we'll see, seems to give a counterexample to that idea. And the reason is because that, so the Gossman nil theorem shows that certain entanglement producing operations are efficiently classically simulable. Now, what I want to argue, to, what I'm going to argue today is that the Gossman nil theorem doesn't show us that entanglement is insufficient. Or at least I'm going to argue that. So what, what I'll, what I'll, as we'll see, all of the Gossman, all of the Gossman nil operations admit of a lo locally causal description. That's way, that's a way of unpacking what the Gossman nil theorem tells us. But I'm going to argue that we actually don't need the Gossman nil theorem to tell us that. Although it, it is, I'm not denying that it's an illuminating theorem, but it's not an illuminating in, in the sense that, that, that people, that people want to claim that it is. And so we don't need the Gossman nil theorem to tell us that, that all of the operations in the Gottsman nil uh, set of operations are give us admit of a locally causal description because we should already know this on the basis of an, an analysis of the Bell inequality. So I want to argue Bell inequality is in a, in, a, in a general sense of that term. So what the Gottsman nil theorem shows us is that if we use only the Gottsman nil operations, we'll not have used the entanglement which we've been provided by the, by the quantum state description effectively. We can still say that entanglement is sufficient to make speed up possible. In other words, that no other resources are required. And that claim, I want to argue, is not going to be, is not shown false by the Gossman-Nell theorem. Okay, so here's the outline of the talk. Uh, 
And look, so let's begin by motivating why we might want to think that entanglement is sufficient to enable quantum speed up. Okay, so one way to motivate this, and this is something that comes out of, uh, is, it, is it Linden's paper? I don't remember, I didn't reference it here. But in any case, so one way of, one way of motivating this is, is by looking at the state spaces of combined systems. So if you consider the state space of N two-dimensional quantum systems or qubits, then we combine the state spaces of those individual systems by taking the tensor product of these individual state spaces. Now the dimensionality of the combined state space, as we saw yesterday, is going to be given by the product of the individual dimensionalities. And so the dimensionality of this combined of of, a, of an n-fold two-dimensional uh, quant uh, overall quantum system is going to be two to the n. On the other hand, if we consider the uh, the state space associated with n two-dimensional classical systems or bits. This case, what we need, we, we combine them using the, the, the Cartesian product. And the dimensionality of that overall state space is the sum of the individual dimensionalities of, of, the, of the smaller state spaces. And so we have a dimensionality of two times n. So as we see, the quantum state space scales exponentially, while the classical state space does not. So you might think that quantum uh, systems give you that, give you more resources in that sense. Now, representing in general the state of n qubits requires that we represent two to the n possibilities, right? So n two-dimensional classical systems, on the other hand, can only directly anyway represent two times n possibilities. So when I say directly, I mean because, of, of course, we can always, we can always represent uh, the possibilities of, uh, in a quantum system in a classical way, just we have to do that in an indirect way, which doesn't scale as well, right? So we need we need an exponentially longer description to to give a characterization of of uh, of, of, uh, of a general entangled system in, in in a classical formalism is the idea here the remaining possibilities though what can't be represented are exactly the entangled states which take up the bulk of the quantum mechanical state, state space so they're just there simply aren't enough resources to efficiently so you can simulate but you can't efficiently simulate a quantum algorithm classically well, that's the idea being motivated here because classical systems basically don't become entangled and so so that so that's what motivates the idea that 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 realizing entangled realizing an entangled quantum state should be enough to yield a quantum speed up in some sense okay so now let's look in more detail at the gossman nil theorem. OK, so let's begin with the, uh, with the stabilizer formalism. OK, so call an operation S, OK, call an operation S a stabilizer of a system in the state psi if when, it, when we apply S to psi, we just get psi back again. So. For any state psi stabilized by S, it follows from this that it's the case that applying a unitary transformation to psi is the same as applying a unitary transformation to the state obtained by applying S to psi first. Right? That just follows from that. Pretty straightforward. And it also follows from the definition of a unitary operator, because remember this, so U adjoint times u is just the identity, right? It follows that these two expressions are also equal. And so we can say in the same sense that s stabilizes psi, we can say that u s u dagger stabilizes u psi. So let's take a particular example. So consider the state uh, system in the state, qubit in the state zero, right? So this is going to be stabilized by the z operator just so happens. And so given that that's the case, we might now ask, well, what is the stabilizer of a Hadamard gate, of the state that's obtained by applying a Hadamard gate to, to, the, to the system in the state zero? Well, we can do this by, well, essentially doing this. So we can take H, Z, H dagger, and, the, and that is equivalent to an X, X gate. And so the stabilizer of this state is the x operator. 
Now consider a slightly bigger system. So imagine we have a system that's comprised of n qubits, all initialized in the state zero. Okay, so the stabilizers, so one set of stabilizers for this set, and in fact, this is a minimal, this is a minimal set, is the following. So the so so here's one stabilizer for this state. It's applying z to the first qubit and the identity to all of the other qubits. This and this one, we apply z to the second qubit and the identity to all the other qubits, and so on. Okay. This is actually uh, this is actually a minimal set in the sense that this set generates is is the generator in the group theoretic sense, the generator for for the group of stabilizers for that state. And a shorthand for this is that, right? So z one, so so z applied to the first qubit, z applied to the second qubit, and so on. This 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 is another way of writing this this set. And so now we can talk about so given that this is the stabilizer for this, we can talk about the stabilizer of an n-fold Hadamard gate applied to an n-fold uh, uh, system in the zero state. And the stabilizer of this state is this one, so x1, x2, and so on. Okay. So in that sense, we can take x1, x2 to xn to represent this state. Now that's interesting because, well, you might think it's interesting because if you consider the action of an n-fold Hadamard gate on n qubits in the state zero, well, if we expand this out, we'll see that as, as we saw yesterday, this is an exponentially long description in the sense that it specifies two to the n different uh, superposition terms. However, this description is only linear in n. And so using the stabilizer formalism, one can prove the gottsman nil theorem. And the gottsman nil theorem uh, tells us that any algorithm using only the following operations is efficiently simulable by a classical computer. Okay? And so the operations are state pre so state preparation of product states of qubits in the zero one basis, measurements of products of Pauli observables, the Clifford group of gates, Pauli gates, phase gates, controlled knot gates, and Hadamard gates, and as well as Clifford gate, Clifford group gates that are conditioned on classical bits. So like, so apply, applying a gate depending on whether I give you a, a, a certain value of a bit or not. So these are the operations that the gossman nil theorem tells us can be efficiently simulable classically. So how does it do this? Well, essentially what I just did in the last slide, we express the state evolution corresponding to uh, a given combination of these operations in the stabilizer formalism. And then what we get is an, instead of an exponentially uh, long description, we get a small, i.e. Uh, a linear description of the system that is efficiently class calculable classically. Now, why this is especially interesting is because gottsman nil operations, so operations just in this set, are capable of generating entangled states. So for example, let's begin with uh, a, pre a preparation of a product state on the computational basis. We'll, do, we'll start with 0, 0. Now apply a Hadamard gate to the first qubit. And this gives us that superposition. Okay. Now apply a controlled not gate, and that's going to give us one of the Bell states, which is a maximally entangled state. And similarly, depending on what state preparation we begin with, we can we can use these two gates to get any one of the Bell states that we like. And in fact, this is this is uh, this is not only that, but these operations are actually utilized in the teleportation protocol. No, no other operations besides these are used. So that's interesting as well. Right? So Yosha and Linden uh, write a comment on the significance of the gottsman nil theorem in their 2003 paper. And I want to I quote it at length because I'll be, I'll be criticizing it. And so they, they write that 
Recall that the significance of entanglement for pure state computations is derived from the fact that unentangled pure states of n qubits have a description involving poly n parameters in contrast to on the order of two to the n parameters for a general pure state. Before I go on, I just want to clarify that in that paper, they actually uh, prove a theorem that, that, that shows that entanglement is actually necessary for quantum speed up when we consider the, 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 the standard formalism. Uh, but now they're, now they're addressing the question of sufficiency. And now they, and they go on. So, but this special property of, of unentangled states, of having small descriptions, is contingent on, on a particular mathematical description as amplitudes in the computational basis. If we were to adopt some other choice of mathematical description for quantum states and their evolution, then although it will be mathematically equivalent to the amplitude description, there will be a different class of states which will now have a polynomially, polynomially, polynomially sized description. With this in mind, we see that the, the significance of entanglement as a resource for quantum computation is not an intrinsic property of quantum physics itself, but is tied to a particular additional arbitrary choice of mathematical formalism for the theory. An implicit example of an, of an alternative formalism and its implications for the power of quantum computation is provided by the so-called stabilizer formalism and the gossman mill theorem. So you might think that's a little strange, perhaps. And, I'll, I'll, and so the one, the one reason why you might think prima facie that that statement is strange, because even just considering the amplitude formalism without considering the stabilizer formalism, it's possible to have differently sized descriptions with respect to uh, one given physical uh, state of a system. So the expressions I gave you earlier, right? So I said that this one is exponentially long. Well, actually, there are a lot of dots in here. <laughs> so, so it gives you an idea that maybe it could be compressed a little bit. And in fact, here is a much shorter description, right? So this, this, short, this description is, is a description of the same state, but it's, it's exponentially smaller than this one. And in fact, we can we can even uh, compress these compress the same description even further. So here's a description of the same state, and here's another description of the same state. So we saw this one yesterday, right? And these are much much smaller. They're not exponentially sized in any sense, right? Now in this case, there's no mystery, right? There's the it's it's the facts about the underlying physics are what make that, that are what make these alternative descriptions possible because the system's in a product state, right? And so we can factorize it in this way, and then further compress it in, in these ways. Now, in the amplitude formalism, it seems that there's no analogous compression possible for entangled states, right? So for entangled states, you can't take a superposition like that and factorize it in this way. And yet, it seems like it's possible to do this using the stabilizer formalism. So that's, that's a puzzle. But rather than, uh, rather than chalk it up to an arbitrary choice of mathematical formalism, uh, as Yosha, Yosha and Linden do, I don't want to deny that that, that might be that might be the reason. But I, I want to I want to just put that to one side, and I want to continue to press on and ask whether whether there might be a physical reason why this might be the case. And so, for the rest of the talk, I want to investigate. Uh, I want to investigate what this physical reason might be. And so I want to begin by asking, well, what's the physical significance of the fact that the gossman nil operations are classical, classically simulable? Well, I guess that's just another way of phrasing this, the point from before. But I want to begin, in particular, by looking at what it means for something to be classically simulable. OK. So my fancy picture of a computer. So what is a classical computer, what one might ask, right? So. I talked about a classical computer yesterday, and I, I said that it implements a number of classical logic gates and so on. But I, I want to go even more fundamental than that. So, like, more even more fundamental than that. What's a, what's a, what is a classical computer in a physical sense? Well, in a physical sense, a classical computer is something that's describable classically, and by this we mean, at least in the context of physics, that it's separable into complete descriptions of its subcomponents. Number one, the descriptions of the of the interactions between its subcomponents are going to be spatial, spatiotemporally continuous uh, descriptions, and they're going to be constrained by classical physical law. For instance, they're going to have to obey the speed, uh, the restrictions imposed by the speed of light, and so on. Now, classical descriptions are also locally causal in Bell's sense, right? No matter how distantly separated subsystems are, 
the, the influences between classical subsystems of larger systems are not going to be, uh, are not going to violate a Bell or a GH set inequality because they're classical systems and they're constrained by the laws of classical physics. So what's the significance of classical simulability? So it, it helps to, to, to maybe think of a, a bit of a playful example. So imagine Bob is in his office and, and his coworker Alice comes in one day and he says, hey, Alice, check out this neat, cool, shiny silver quantum computer on my desk. And she asks, oh, cool, Bob, can I, can I see the inside? And, he's, and for whatever reason, he says, no, maybe you know, like, there are like, uh, intellectual property uh, considerations at play and then so he, can't, he, he won't want to open it or whatever. Given that he won't open it, Alice is legitimate, depending on what the computer does, to be skeptical, uh, skeptical, right? And so suppose that, suppose that she says, okay, well, okay, Bob, show me what your quantum computer can do. And then Bob pushes a button on the quantum computer and it, and it evaluates the result of a computation that can be seen as the result of a sequence of gauss bindel operations. In that case, Alice well, we'll get into the exactly why those that, but anyway, let me back up a bit. So let's say Bob pushes a button and, 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 and the computer gives the result of a calculation that can be seen as the result of some op quantum operations, perhaps, or some operations that can be efficiently achievable via a classical computer. Then in that case, if Bob is not willing to open the box, Alice is within her rights to be skeptical, skeptical because she can challenge Bob and she can say, I don't believe you. I, I'll, I'll show you how, this, how, how that silver box works. It's not a quantum computer, it's actually a classical computer. And when she does this, she'll have given Bob an essentially an alternative description that's classical and locally causal. And if it so happens that the box actually is a quantum box, it's just that you know, like Bob's superiors won't allow him to, to divulge the technical details of it. But let's say it really is a quantum box, then Alice's skeptical model here can be thought of as an alternative classical locally causal description of a quantum phenomenon. Okay. So this is a sense in which I think we should we should be thinking of quantum simulability in its context, a classical simulability in its context. So if we imagine now a quantum computer that undergoes some sequence of Gauss-Bindel nil operations. Now we can construct the classical computer to simulate these operations. And in so doing, we provide, as we just saw, an alternative classical locally causal description of what the quantum computer is doing. In other words, I put that in quotation marks because it's not quite the same thing as we'll see a bit later, but we, we're providing a kind of local hidden variables theory to reproduce the observable quantum behavior that we, that we don't see by hypothesis, right? So we can't open the box up. Now, what I want to point out uh, now is that we don't actually need to look at the stable reform formalism to show that that's possible. Okay. Pacha, uh, Yosha, and Linda. Okay, so now let's look in more detail at the Gottsman nil operations. Okay, so what do the Gottsman nil operations have in common? So let's look uh, first at state preparation. So let's just consider a single qubit. It doesn't uh, this generalizes to as many qubits as like, but let's just consider a single one. So state preparation of a single qubit, either uh, either at zero or one, is going to be stabilized by the Z operator and the minus Z operator, respectively. So, uh, e zero is equivalent to Z zero, one is equivalent to minus Z one. Okay. So and that's going to generalize to a state preparation of a product of qubits, which is which is the which is what the the Gossman Null theorem says as an allowed tells us it's an allowed operation. Now, if you look at the Pauli gates, the x, y, so I'm, I'm uh, ignoring i because it's just a trivial identity gate, but the Pauli gates x, y, and z applied to z are going to give us, so if we apply x to z, then we get negative z, y gives us negative z, and z just gives us z again. Pauli gates apply to x and y. So x applied to x gives us x, y applied to x gives us negative x, z gives us negative x. Uh, and then we can do something similar for y, right? So x 
applied to y gives us negative y, y applied to y gives us y, and z applied to y gives us negative y. We can look at uh, now a Hadamard gate. And now a Hadamard gate takes x to z, y to negative y, and z to x. We saw, we saw that earlier. Now we can look at a phase gate. So a phase gate will take x to y, y to x, and z to z. We can, take, we can look at a controlled not gate. And now this is a two qubit gate, but the result of it is either an identity operation or an x operation applied to the target qubit. So the combined effect of any sequence of only Gauss but nil operations, as we can see, is equivalent to the measurement of one of the Pauli observables, x, y, and z, on one of the eigenstates of a Pauli observable. So what's special about the Pauli observable? So as we saw yesterday, Pauli, Pauli observables correspond to rotate. So I mean, so they're observables, but they're also unitary operators. And I mentioned that that they're special in that way, right? So not all operators, not all observables are unitary, and and vice versa. But in the Pauli case, it's it's it is the case that they are. And so the Pauli observables, insofar as they are unitary operators, can be thought of as corresponding to pi rotations of the block sphere around the x, y, and z axes, respectively, as we saw yesterday. Now, if we, if we prepare an entangled state, and then we set up a kind of aspect experiment, like a, a Bell experiment, to measure to measure, uh, to measure the, the subsystems on at distant locations, so we measure Alice's system here and Bob's system here, then if the directions of our experimental devices are oriented at an angle that's proportional to, sorry, if, 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 the, if the observables we measure at these distance locations, as these distance locations are Pauli observables, then the angle, uh, and the relative angle between the orientations of our experimental device are always going to be proportional to pi over two. Now, what's special about pi over two? Well, pi over two, so angles proportional to pi over two, are these are precisely the orientations for which Bell showed it's possible to provide a local hidden variables theory to reproduce the statistics associated with the singlet state. So let's recall Bell's theorem. So I'm sure you're, you're probably all familiar with this, but let's just recall this for, for, uh, for just to, to get us up to speed here. So, so assuming that in the CHSH form, in the CHSH form that, re that relates ex that relates to expectation values, so the theorem says that if we assume that the outcomes of local experiments, so on the on the distant at the distant uh, measurement locations, depend only on the local setups, you know, local setup here and local setup here, and on the value of some hidden variable lambda that's assigned to the combined system at state preparation, then if we relate the expectation values for different uh, possible measurements we might perform on that system, then if we assume this, then this relation is going to be bounded by two. And famously, this is violated by quantum mechanical statistics in general. So to take one example, consider the measurement directions m, m prime, n, and m prime, and imagine that they lie in the same plane and that they, and, and that they have respective orientations of zero, pi over two, pi over four, and negative pi over four, then given that in the singlet state, the expectation value of m uh, cross n is given by the negative dot product of m and n, then it's easy to show that for these orientations, this expression evaluates to two root two, which is not less than or equal to two. And so quantum mechanical statistics actually violate the CHSH inequality. However, if we restrict the measurement directions that we're allowed to, to measure, then there's no conflict. So if we restrict the M and N to measurement directions that are all oriented at angles that are proportional to pi over two, then, then I'll leave it as an exercise to you to, to calculate this out and, and you can show that actually it, we don't actually violate the bound when we restrict the measurement angles to, to angles that are, that are oriented with respect to one another at angles proportional to pi over two. And these are just the Pauli measurements. Okay, so here's an example. So consider the singlet state of two spin and a half particles. Okay, so in the singlet state, the expectation values for products of Pauli observables are all zero except for these ones. And these ones are all equal to one expectation, uh, negative one. 
expectation value. So now imagine that lambda hat is our hidden variable. And we imagine that it's an arbitrary unit three vector. So in, in Cartesian coordinates, we can represent it in this way, okay? where theta is taken to be the angle that uh, the angle that lambda makes with x, the unit vector representing our x-axis in the xy plane. And phi is the angle that lambda makes with z, which is our z-axis in the z and, and the z-x plane. Okay, so this is the way this is the most general way of representing in Cartesian coordinates our hidden variable. So now Bell in I forget if it was a 64 or 66 paper, gave a local hidden variables theory for this state. Okay. So if you're Alice and you measure the system of the subsystem on your end of the apparatus in the m direction, then what you do is you take the dot product of m dot lambda, right? And then you take the sign, either negative or positive. And that's going to be that's going to be what you predict for, for, for what you get when you measure. And if you're Bob, you do the same thing with your direction, except that you take you're going to take the negative sign. Okay? So Bell famously gave a hidden variables theory for that for that case for, for, for uh, of that form, right? And he showed that this is going to be uh, satisfied when angles are oriented with respect to one another, pi over two. So, for example, um, if Alice measures x, then we take x, the dot product of x and lambda, and that's just going to give us uh, cosine theta, sine theta. Take the sine of that; that's going to be uh, uh, it's positive, and then Bob is going to take the negative sign of that, which is going to be the opposite of Alice's sign. Okay, so that's that, that's that's literally the way uh, Bell gave this variable theory, pretty much literally. Now I'm going to I want to give you a slightly different way of expressing this. So rather than taking sine and negative sine, I want to think of it in terms of a transformation p. So let let t be a transformation that takes a vector x, y, and z to the negative of all its components. And so we can rewrite this hidden variable theory in that form, right? So, so Alice takes the sine of m, uh, the dot product of m and the hidden variable lambda. Bob transforms lambda according to t, and then takes a dot product of n with that and takes a sine of it. And it gives you the same result that you got earlier. And in fact, by doing this, uh, so in fact, by doing this, we can talk, we can give a similar hidden variables theory to the one that Bell gave for all of the Bell states. So for example, take, take a, the, the Bell state phi plus, right? Which is similar to the, similar to, well, actually no, very different, <laughs> but it's another Bell state. So we take the, the, the Bell state phi plus. Now this one, the expectation values of products of, for products of poly observables are all zero, except for these, these three. So these two are going to be one, and this one's going to be negative one. And we can cast hidden variables theory for the state for Pauli observables. That's in the same form as the one we previously gave, except now the transformation matrix, uh, the transformation is different, right? So now it, it takes x to x and z to z, but it takes the negative of y. And we can do something similar for phi minus another Bell state. Now the transformation is slightly different again. For psi plus, this transformation will work. And now we and we can take even even like other entangled states that are not Bell states. So here's an entangled state that's a superposition of uh, zero and minus, where minus is minus in the x spaces and one and plus, right? So minus and plus are the eigenstates of the x operator. And so we have this entangled state. And now we can give uh, we can give another hidden variables theory in, in the same form as before, but this one is going to take use this transformation. And similarly, uh, superposition of zero and y minus one and y plus. We have this transformation, and so on. Now here's here's a here y eigenstates in this case, and so forth. And so the upshot is that the statistics for any bipartite entangled combination, comp so two party entangled combination of eigenstates of Pauli observables 
that are subjected to Pauli measurements can be recovered with the local hidden variables theory, a la Bell. But these are just the states and measurements that are accessible from the Gossman nil group. Now, we talked about the two-party case, but we can, we can expand the discussion to, to, uh, to more than two parties. And here it gets a bit more interesting. So consider the, the, the Greenberger, Horn, and Zeilinger stake. And this is similar form to the, uh, to the singlet stake, but this one, has, uh, this one has three parties in it. And we can show, so Tessier has shown, that you can give a classical simulation of Pauli measurements on the GHZ state. What's interesting is that one bit must sometimes be communicated to ensure that all combined Pauli measurements, Pauli measurement results are consistent with one another. And we'll see how this works in a minute. And in general, we can, so we can generalize that. So for any state that's generable, generable from Gossman nil operations, we can use something like the procedure I'm about to give you uh, to classically simulate the measurement results. But now we just need, it's always going to be an amount of bits that's linear, linear in n, right? n minus 2. We're going to require a few more bits, but we can still do it. We can still do it pretty easily, right? And I'll show you how this works. So first, in case uh, some of you are familiar with the GZ and GZ equality, but I'm I'd be surprised if every single one of you was. So let me just briefly introduce, uh, brief, briefly introduce this. So here's the GHZ state. And so now in this state, if we consider Pauli observables, then the eigenvalue, so the value associated with the measurement on a Pauli observable of x, y, and z, all of these, so these are spin operators, so we're going to have a plus or minus one. Right? So each of, each of them can take either a value of plus or minus one. On the other hand, in that state, the value is associated with combined measurements. So x, y, y, and these particular ones, x, y, 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 x, y, and y, y, x are all going to be equal to one. Now, if we assume that these values are non-contextual, so-called elements of reality, so they, they're, so like if there's a value assigned to the X bin, then it just is the value assigned to it for that system. And it's not going to change depending on what measurement you do before. Right? So if we assume that, then these, uh, so this value should be factorizable into the product of the, of the, of the individual values for, for these three measurements but, uh, uh, that you predict for these three measurements and same for the other ones. But if that's true, then since these are all equal to one, this whole product should be equal to one as well. Now, given that these are non-contextual, if VYB appears twice here, then we should understand it to have the same value in both cases. And given that it can either be plus one or minus one, then if you take the square of that, it just is one. And so we can do the same thing and cancel all of these out. And so we're left with this product and we see that under the assumption that the, the VXs are non-contextual, quote unquote, elements of reality, that this should be the case. That contradicts, however, famously, the, uh, the quantum mechanical prediction for this observable of negative one. And so the conclusion, uh, uh, the conclusion that, that, that people make is that quantum mechanics is inconsistent with the, at least a, a, a straightforward or naive notion of, of elements of reality. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, make sense of it in some other way in, in another, another more sophisticated hidden variables formulation. But that, but that, uh, but that easy, straightforward way is going to be ruled out. OK. Nevertheless, we can classically simulate these, these the GHZ correlations in the following way. So here's a local hidden, here's a, sorry, here's a hidden variables theory. Not quite local yet. Here's a hidden, hidden variables theory that's given by uh, given by Tessier and by uh, as well as Caves and other researchers. And so here's this is basically hidden variables theory for GHZ correlations, and I'll show you how this works. So here are the systems, and here are the measurements on the systems. So if, for example, if we take uh, here's it gives you a recipe essentially. If we consider an X measurement on all three of A, B, and C, then the way that we calculate that is that we take, we multiply our, this entry, right, XA, XB, and XC, 
And now the way that we interpret these R's is that, so we imagine that the R's are hidden variables and the R's are going to take non-contextually values of plus or minus one. So imagine that when we prepare the state, it get uh, these R's get a value of plus or minus one. They don't change, they stay the same, uh, but we don't know what they are. So now if we, if we do a combined X measurement on all three, the way that we calculate the result is that is we, is we multiply this entry, that entry, and that entry. And so the, given that these, the, these are non-contextual, the R2s are going to cancel out, the R3s are going to cancel out, and the result is going to be negative one. If, on the other hand, we perform an X, Y, Y measurement, then now we take minus R2, R3, times i r1 r2 times i r1 r3. And if we work that out, that's going to give us negative i squared, which is just one. Okay. And if, on the other hand, we perform uh, an x and a y measurement on a and b and then do nothing to c, then we do negative 2 r3 times, neg uh, times i r1 r2 and times 1. And now in this case, we're going to get, we're going to get a, a value of plus or minus i. And the rule that we follow here is that we just, if we have a lone straggling i that's not squared, we just get rid of it and collapse that to plus or minus one and so on. And so in this way, you can show that, you can show that all of the, all of the GH set statistics for any, for any particular measurement you, you, you'll make are gonna be recovered by this, by this scheme actually. But there's a problem is that even though any measurement you can specify is going to be correctly predicted by this scheme, it isn't the case that the, these measurements are going to be factorizable in general. So sim similarly to what we saw before. So if we take an x, y, y, for example, so as we saw, this gives us one, but that's not going to be equal to the product of the values for an x, i, 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 y, i, and i, i, y, right? Because that would be the natural product. So the product of these three measurements is going to be negative one, which is not the same as one. And that's natural and it's totally unsurprising given, given the nature of the GH set state and the nature of the GH set argument that we gave before, right? But there's a solution to this and we can, we can correct this by, by, by signaling, by, send, by, by Bob sending Alice one classical bit. So the, the rule is that if Bob measures Y, then he'll send a classical bit to Alice to tell her so. Like he'll, he'll tell he'll send a classical bit to Alice to tell her whether he measured Y or not or not. And if and then when Alice gets that bit, Alice will 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 reason that if either she or Bob measured a Y, then she should flip her bit. She, she should flip her flip her answer. Otherwise, she should leave it as is. And if you do that, then you'll see that in this case the solution works out correctly. And in fact all measurements become factorizable in the scheme with a single bit. And in the general case where we consider more than three parties, we need n minus two bits to do it. So now you might think there's a bit of a tension here in what I've been saying. So on the one hand, I said before that classical simulations are in some sense, I'll put it in quotation marks because I, I didn't hear, but there's some sense they're local hidden variables descriptions. And yet, as we've just seen, they, they sometimes involve communication. But in foundational uh, discussions of quantum mechanics, normally when we think of communication... Uh, we think Michael, of, we have a, a question by Patricia. So Patricia, uh, you can yeah. talk. Yep. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, just a clarification. Is the n minus 2 bits applicable to any n product state or only to the DHZ state? Um, so any, any superposition of eigenstates of Pauli observables. So any G H set state, but not only any G, any G set state. So you can have like three party states, like the ones I showed you before that involve superpositions of like, like zero and Y plus and that kind of thing. So anything, I mean, I'll actually, I'll actually say that explicitly in, in one of the, one of the next slides that it, that it. It's it's not just for GHZ, but for any any Gaussman nil uh, achievable uh, state. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, where is there we go? Okay. So now you might think 
there's a tension here because of, because earlier I said that classical simulations are local hidden variables descriptions in some sense. And yet now I just said that, well, they, they, they sometimes can involve communication, i.e. they can, but, but in foundational uh, contexts, foundational discussions of quantum mechanics, normally when we talk of, about communication, we're thinking of parameter independence and para parameter dependence. And parameter dependence is usually taken as a sign of non-local uh, non local influences. So what gives? What is, what is the what is going on here? How can how can these two uh, statements be consistent with one another? And now let's begin to resolve this. Uh, let's let's see how let's see what what it, what this is supposed to really mean. And to do this, I want to distinguish between so-called practical and theoretical context of discussion, right? And so before I make that distinction explicitly. I want to begin to resolve the tension by noting that to actually ob observe the results of a joint measurement requires that we combine the individual measurement outcomes and compare them, right? So we might hold that a particular value for, for this system is obtained here, a particular value for this system is obtained there. We might infer that on the basis of theory, but if we actually want to confirm that, then whether it's whether it's a mediator or whether uh, Bob sends something to Alice or vice versa, there has to be some communication of the of the results of those outcomes in order to compare them and compare the statistics with you know local hidden variables there. And so that like that's unavoidable. Just, I mean, that's just the, like 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 if you want to observe the results of a joint measurement, then you need to combine the measurement outcomes and, and observe them. Right, so whether you meet over T uh, and discuss the measurement results, or whether whether I I, I phone Alice, or whether uh, Alice and Bob phone me, or whatever, like somehow these measurement results need to be collected and, and and compared. And so, given that, it's possible for classical communication, for example, a telephone call, to occur within the past light cone of that measurement. And from this point of view, the mutual influences on measurement outcomes are not non-local because, again, the signal in here is local. They're subluminal. Now, you might still be unhappy because you might say, well, that's strange. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a real hidden variables theory. That's ad hoc. And yeah, it is ad hoc. It's certainly very ad hoc. You might say, well, that's not a hidden variables theory. It's, it's too conspiratorial, right? Like you're, you're positing that, that, you know, that nature is, is somehow changing the results in a way that's, that's hidden from you and yet at a, at a, a supplemental level and so on. And yeah, that's also conspiratorial. And you might also claim that that doesn't faithfully represent the situation according, uh, according to quantum mechanics. And yeah, in a sense, that's true because, I mean, assuming that you take uh, collapse literally in the quantum formalism, then collapse is instantaneous. And that's not happening. Uh, that's not happening uh, in this case, right? Because there's some time in between before you know, measurement there's, there's no real collapse in that, in that sense here. There's some time before measurement results are combined and so on. And so in a sense, it doesn't faithfully represent the situation according to quantum mechanics. Well, well, that's true in some sense. However, it still reproduces all of the actually observed effects. And in, so a hidden variable theory, of course, should posit hidden variables, but we shouldn't require of a hidden variable theory that it, that, it, that it gives us the same theoretical story that quantum mechanics gives us. That's the point of the hidden variables theory. It should give us an alternative story. Okay, so now Bell's and related inequalities are not no-go theorems per se. Okay? So rather, a better way to think of Bell's and related inequalities is that, the, is that they specify constraints. These are the properties that a locally causal description of a system that gives rise to a joint probability distribution must satisfy. These are very general constraints. In a sense, they're no more than theorems of probability. And that's not a fault, because that's what gives them their indisputable power, right? Because when somebody says, oh, the Bell, the Bell inequalities are wrong, as, uh, or like are incorrect, as some people claim, I mean, they can't be wrong. They're just theorems of probability, right? So like they're, like they're really minimal statements in that sense. That's, that's, what, that's what makes them so powerful. But along with that power, comes something else. Because if we want to make a meaningful distinction between what is and what isn't ruled out by them, in order to turn them into no-go theorems rather than just inequalities, we need to assume a particular context of discussion. Okay, so 
when we talk about local hidden variables descriptions, now I'm not quoting this, I, I'm not putting scare quotes around it. When you talk about a local hidden variables description, we're asking the we're asking the question, which we situate in what I'll call the theoretical context, but you might think of the context of you know foundational investigations of physics. The question is, does quantum mechanics approximate some deeper underlying theory of the world? And if so, what is that theory? That's the question we're asking. In discussions of foundations of quantum mechanics, we don't need to explicitly say that because everybody understands that, that that's what we're doing. And our answers, which we refer to in this case as local hidden variables theories, must be very serious answers. They can't be ad hoc, playful models like this one. Okay. For example, uh, so they must, in the sense that they need to satisfy certain plausibility constraints. For example, they must be consistent with other physical theories. Well, I won't say must be, but they, sh they should be ideally. And if they aren't, then we should, there should be a good reason why we should, why we should give up those previous physical theories. Now, most so-called loopholes to the Bell inequalities don't satisfy these plausibility constraints and are ruled out of consideration on those grounds. So you can, it's, with a little imagination, it's always possible to imagine a loophole. But when we actually come to fund experiments to close loopholes, we don't bother closing the crazy and plausible ones. We, we, we focus on the ones that actually might make sense. Right. And so, uh, so one of the ones that I think we, maybe shouldn't bother closing is the uh, collapse locality loophole that was given by Adrian Kent in 2005. That's actually very similar to the, to the, to this model I gave, right? So on Kent's model, measurement, so collapses don't occur at space like separation. They occur. Uh, so to, to determine a collapse, we need to judge what happens in the, in the past light cone process. So collapses in the previous light cone of a process will matter for what happens, what happens in a previous situation. And so you can read it. So I mean, I'm being a little bit unfair, maybe to Kent. Uh, it's more plausible than I make it. It's not quite as ad hoc as the one I just gave, but uh, but uh, but still, you know, there are a number of there are plausibility considerations for for why we would want to take this seriously or not. Right. Now, the theoretical context, the context that we normally operate in foundational physics, isn't the only one that that we can that we can discuss the Bell inequalities in. Another context is what I'll call the purely conceptual context, and here the question is is what is the question of what is logically possible and still consistent with the predictions of quantum mechanics. And here the answers don't need to be too serious, right? So. Here we're concerned with so-called toy theories where there's no fixed plausibility constraints. So we'll have plausibility constraints on a case-by-case -case basis, perhaps, but there's nothing that unifies all of the all of the all of the all of the answers to the question in this context, I would say. So and the purely conceptual context is useful for making conceptual distinctions. So for so a good example of this, I think, is uh, given in Maudlin's 2011 edition of his uh, quantum non-locality book where he uses a kind of toy theory of the sort to make a distinction between outcome independence and separability, which are famously equated by Don Howard, right? Now, it's not a, not a criticism of Maudlin to say of his toy theory that it's physically implausible. Of course it is, but that's not the point, right? The point is just to illustrate that these concepts are distinct. Now, the practical context is the next one I wanna talk about, and this is the one I wanna focus on is actually it's not the same thing as the other two. So in this context, the question is, what can we do in order to reproduce this, these statistics associated with the quantum system in a classical way? And this is not the theoretical context because we're not in this, in this situation seeking for a viable alternative theory of the natural world. Okay, so imagine we're in, in, in Bob's office again. We're looking for an explanation of how this shiny silver box on Bob's desk is able to do what it does assuming that somebody built that box, right? And, and, and given what I just said, so this is also clearly not the purely conceptual context because the constraints are going to be fixed, right? So on the one hand, so I mean, I mean not all of the constraints will be fixed, but there, there will be fixed plausibility constraints. So on the one hand, we still need to obey the laws of classical physics, right? Or at least, I mean, or if, if not, then we should give a good reason why not. And the other thing that's, that's more important 
for, for, for our purposes is that given that we presuppose that these systems have actually been built by someone, we need to take into consideration that, they, that we are finite beings. So the complexity involved in the specification of system, such a system should be tractable. So if, so if Bob has his fancy, shiny, silver uh, quantum computer on his desk, and it evaluates some, some, the, the answer to some function, and Alice is skeptical, and in response to Bob, gives a model of a classical computer that takes an enormous amount of resources to compute its solution. Then Bob is, would be within his rights to say, your skepticism is misplaced, right? Because nobody could have built such a thing. I couldn't have built it. Nobody else could have. So efficient classical computer simulations answer, I would argue, the practical question. They provide not local hidden variables theories, not toy theories, but practical classical theories for recovering some of the statistics associated with quantum computational informational systems. Now, I've used a few different terms. I've talked about local hidden variables theories in the theoretical context. I've talked about toy theories in the purely conceptual context. I've talked about practical classical theories in the practical context. But conceptually speaking, these are all species of the same genus. Right? They're all locally causal descriptions which satisfy Bell's and related inequalities. Different names help to convey the context, but really they're all, like I said, they're all species of the same genus. And for the rest of the talk, I think, I'm just going to be using the more generic term. Well, maybe not. <laughs> so which practical classical theories are plausible, you might ask. So is this one plausible? So if we have, if we have, a, if we have a computation that requires n minus 2 a, an additional bits, in relation to our input, then yes, that's a, that's a tractable, practical is a tractable, practical classical alternative theory of, of those of the statistics that you're that you're trying to reproduce. And by tractable, we mean the complexity theoretic definition of tractable tractability, in the sense that if we have two solutions, a solution C and a solution Q to a problem that are equivalent, that we say that they're equivalent from a complexity theoretic point of view. If one requires only polynomially more resources than the other, in that sense, C is going to be no harder than Q, if that's the case, in the complexity theoretic sense. So theories which aim to reproduce quantum operations within the gaussman nil set, more gen generally speaking, are able to do this with a small number of resources in the complexity theoretic sense. So in general, for any state generable from gaussman nil operations, we require n minus two extra bits to consistently classically simulate the poly measurements on these states. Recovering the gaussian nil operations locally causally, ca causally therefore, is going to be plausible in the practical context. More generally, though, so, but that's only for poly measurements. If we expand the, allow this, this, the, the allowed measurements, that, that, so the measurements that we're allowed to perform, then in general, no practical classical theory, it seems, uh, I don't, I don't, so I don't believe Tessier proved this in his paper, but it's, he conjectured it. So uh, it seems that no practical classical theory is going to be able to tractably recover the statistics associated with states that are generated from operations that are outside of the gaussian nil set, because the required classical communication seems like it's going to have to grow exponentially. Okay, so getting close to the close to the end now. OK, so does, to answer the question that we began with, so does the Gottsman Null Theorem show us that entanglement is insufficient for quantum speed up? Now, as I argue, the upshot of the Gottsman Null Theorem is essentially that some entanglement generating operations are efficiently classically simulable. But as I argued, also, classical simulation is a kind of locally causal description. And so we can rephrase the upshot of the of the of Gaussian nil theorem as the, the statement that some statistics associated with entangled states admit of a locally causal description. But we already knew we already knew that we didn't need the Gaussian nil theorem to tell us that because the Bell inequalities constrained what locally causal descriptions must look like in a given context, and we don't need the gottsman nil theorem to tell us that the locally causal descriptions for reproducing these particular measurements are plausible in the practical context. And we also don't need the gottsman nil theorem to tell us that most quantum statistics are not plausibly locally describable in that way. So let me, so let, let me 
begin to end <laughs> by distinguishing two possible senses of sufficiency. So if I say that entanglement is, is sufficient for, for quantum speed up, I might mean that in two different ways. So on the one hand, I might mean that in the sense of simply possessing an entangled state is going to be sufficient to give me speed up. And that the gottsman mill theorem shows is conclusively, I think, is false. You need the, more to it than simply possessing an entangled state. But if we ask the question whether entanglement is, a, is sufficient as a resource to enable quantum speed up, then I would argue that that assertion is true, or at least, or at the very least, we, we should say that it's not proved false by the gottsman mill theorem. Right. So, and so as an analogy, imagine imagine I tell you that a life vest is is sufficient to save you if you fall off your if you're off your canoe in the middle of a lake. Then, I mean, when I say that, I, I'm implicitly I'm implicitly supposing that you're actually wearing the thing, not that it's just lying in the boat. Right. And I'll close with another analogy. So, in 1935, uh, Schrodinger famously argued that entanglement was the characteristic feature of a quantum mechanical system. So that's a controversial thesis. So there, there are others, so Feynman held that it actually was interference uh, and, and, and so on. And, and so despite the fact that Schrodinger said that it's still a controversial thesis, but whatever one thinks of that thesis, it isn't disproven by pointing out that Bell showed in the 1960s that some operations on some entangled states can be given a locally causal description. Likewise, pointing out essentially the same thing in the context of quantum computing isn't in itself an argument against the thesis that entanglement is sufficient for quantum speedup. And with that, I'll just end. Thanks. <laughs>